It's Wellness Wednesdays. It's Wellness Wednesdays. And we're doing a precursor topic this Wellness Wednesday. So I can get into the other topics everybody wants to talk about. Now, there will be a lot of self-validation technique in this video. But by way of another skill that also builds into overcoming learned helplessness, uh, resisting the urge to lash out in a form of ego defense. Um, this is a big building block that to me personally, and again, Wellness Wednesday and the ensuing programs I'm developing are all about my personal experience. This isn't stuff you find in a book. This is stuff I've lived. Uh, I think conventional wisdom is actually wrong regarding the really reductive way that explanatory styles are presented, aka the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. If you like this content, if you find this helpful for you, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. Um, I got very positive feedback about the idea of Zoom calls. Um, I am in the process of setting up that system, it will take some time uh, just because waivers need to be drafted and portals need to be created and all that fun stuff. Um, and so I'm in the process of doing that. Um, but we're talking about explanatory styles today and how this ties into sense of self. Okay. Now, I'm going to try to avoid jargon on this because the official terms for this stuff, they sound like Mortal Kombat finishing moves, right? Like, there are three parameters of explanatory style. Internality, stability, and globality. Like, immediately I was like, internality, stability, globality. You know, Shang Tsung wins, internality. Like, what does that mean? What are these words? These, these, are, these are academic, like, I'm going to make a word that's based on other words, but it wasn't quite this word. Tenure, here I come, right? That's not life. We don't care about that, right? I'm going to give you guys how it actually works. Now, the conventional wisdom on this that, again, I think is wrong is that you have certain binary choices about the stories you tell yourself about yourself and what happens to you. And one of these choices is optimistic and one of these choices is pessimistic. And the people who make the hardwired optimistic choice tend to be healthier and suffer and happier and suffer from less depression and anxiety and other mental health conditions than the people who make the more pessimistic choice. I have not found this to be the case in practice. I find that a good balance of two out of three, be optimistic on two points, allow yourself pessimism on one to put yourself in the right direction so you can make good choices that don't keep you stuck but don't have you racing off a cliff either, right? It's like it's like the golden mean. It's it's you know the the whole Buddhist like the the path between the two extremes thing, right? There's there's three main what they call parameters. Um, we're gonna call them you know narrative branches in the stories you tell yourself about yourself. One is whether something is temporary or permanent. Now, conventional wisdom is that if you tell yourself something is temporary, that's better, that's more optimistic than if you tell yourself something is permanent. Yes, that's true in most instances, but for me, for instance, I've had points in my life where I've had to accept something was permanent. My appendix blew up when I was, I was just shy of being old enough of turning pro as as a dancer they were actually talking about forging my birth certificate so that I could audition for you know tap dance driven shows um and then I 
had appendicitis. It was misdiagnosed. It ruptured. I ended up with gangrene, a piece of my small intestine fused to my large intestine. Bye bye dance career. That was not something I could mind over matter. Okay. That was permanent. Now, you guys see me dancing around, you know, the Prince of Sparkle Pony stuff. I, I still use that. But that's that's the Steve Martin, you know, I can't dance, but I can dance funny kind of thing. I can't sing, but I can sing funny. I highly recommend Steve Martin's uh, autobiography. It's called Born Standing Up. Um, but th that wasn't something I could say this is temporary. You know, I could have spent years and years and years toiling chasing something that wasn't going to happen because I couldn't accept that bad fucking health luck, right? Instead, I was like, okay, this isn't changing. What have I got left, right? And that's the next narrative branch in the stories you tell yourself about yourself, explanatory styles. Is this something universal in your life? Just catastrophic affects everything? Or is it specific to one part of your life? They, they define this as global versus local, right? You know, like I said, that was a bit of bad luck. What happened to me with my appendix blowing up. It was fucking nasty. Like I almost died. Um gangrene modern day gangrene woo that's hardcore civil war reenactment right there um you know was that shitty luck yeah it was shitty luck does that mean i overall have bad luck well i felt like i did for a long time like that that knocked me flat for a while it was just like you watch everybody else continuing to do this thing you loved and you can't like it's it's hard right and sometimes you you have to just recognize okay that door is closing it's not going to be that but you can choose to keep chasing after the old and busted or you can find some new hotness right i ended up turning to like you know i was i was very fortunate to have a a a, a dance teacher who was, uh, her performing name was Maxine Ross. She was an old uh, wartime performer. And so, you know, we were we were educated in, in vaudeville and, and that sort of, you know, mixed performance traditions. Um, and so comedy was alongside dance. It's like, all right, I've always kind of been between the two worlds. I always enjoyed... I was a theater nerd. I enjoyed mime. I just admitted that in public. Oh, Lord. Um, but, you know, okay, I can't do the dance part, but I can still do the funny part. Let's try that. You know, my mother wanted me to just go into science. The idea of, you know, being in a lab for the rest of my life didn't appeal to me. I, I needed, I needed more touches of the sublime, right? You know, you just, you just, Get that? You you decide whether you decide whether you wanna you want to enhance the quantity of people's lives or the quality of people's lives. And I'm like, well, I can be a scientist and, and try to like cure some disease. I'm a little too improv for that. I'm not real good on, you know. I'm I'm better than average, but am I am I the most like meticulous thinker? No, I'm probably better focusing on quality than quantity. I'd probably kill more people than I save. So all right, quality of life. I'm gonna do things that entertain people in one way or another. I don't have to do that with dance, right? I, I don't. Dance, ironically, was what my mother put me in because I was, you know, like really like shy to the point of barely speaking in public I know right hard to imagine now um but there was another thing going on at the time as well and you know I've talked about this before that I had the the double whammy of with competitive dance obviously like weight and appearance is a big thing and 
and you know for I, I was one of those kids that you know those kids that like you gain a bunch of weight and then you grow and you gain a bunch of weight and you grow so I had this identity as a fat ugly nerd you know we, you know the whole Eric Cartman gingers are evil and freak us out you know like the whole thing um so I I had that you're creepy and ugly and you have no soul and th th that wasn't that wasn't there at the time but you, you get this you get this brand as a kid right like my sister was the cute one I was the smart one don't try to be cute don't try to be funny don't try to be seen you're smart you're the little human brain right don't try to be this other thing you're this life does brand you and you have a choice in life whether to accept that external branding or whether to decide for yourself who you are, right? And, and this is a constant struggle throughout life. Um, conventional wisdom says that those who, who have more external explanatory styles, you know, it wasn't my fault, are happier, are less stressed. People who have internal explanatory styles, this is my fault, tend to have more stress, more anxiety, more depression. I don't agree with that. Because before I got um, intensive PTSD therapy, I had an external locus of control. I let the outside world, you know, circumstances beyond my control really control my thinking. Um, and I, I talked about before how I went through this, you know, this sort of polar shift when I was in my 20s and, you know, went from being a writer and a producer on television to being on air that I went from being an ugly, fat, nerdy, de-gendered brain to a cheap slut that people only cared about because I looked nice. Like, they were completely, they were completely contradictory narratives about the same person, right? And it, it was like this, this like matrix moment, right? Red pills kind of co-opted, but it was like this blinding by the light moment of, wait a minute, both these things can't be true. Like, gee, maybe the truth's somewhere in between. Maybe it's like, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not somebody who's ever going to get by just on my looks. But hey, maybe I'm not a disgusting slime monster either, right? Like, maybe there's some value here. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. And that's why I don't like these binary self-help methods. Because I find the thought, the thing that, helped me the thing that settled me is it's not good bad optimistic pessimistic winner loser it's holy shit good enough for these purposes right just just good enough right i i, I don't i don't need to be the best looking person in a given room you know i don't need to be the absolute funniest person in every given room i don't need to be the smartest person in any given room i i don't need to be the most educated. I don't need to be the most empathic because you know what? All around, you know, I can do all these things all right when I try. I don't have to be the best at any one thing. I, I can just be me and find something that works for me based on a middle ground, not hard and fast binary choices, right? And yeah, sometimes it does help to um to really make things simple and feel like you have a sense of control by asking yourself a series of yes no questions that is the building block but the way these explanatory styles tie into self-validation techniques is you've got to get out of the all or nothing game and this is wellness wednesday so I'm going to give you a technique to do it, to try. If it doesn't work for you, 
tweak it until it does. Because this is about the stories you tell yourself, right? So there's two types of characters we know when, when we design are, are, are badly written characters, right? You've got the kind of character that does nothing. On the one hand, everything happens to them as opposed to them having any character agency. They make choices that affect the plot, right? That's usually seen to be an uninteresting character that, that uh, audiences have trouble relating to. And then on the other extreme, you got the Mary Sue, the character that is just so inexplicably awesome that they break the world around them. Now, we know when we analyze narratives that both these characters are mistakes. And yet, when we think about ourselves, when we talk about our internal narratives, our own explanatory styles, we're either the person with absolutely no control over anything, or we expect we have to be a fucking Mary Sue, right? Like, if you're really honest with yourself, this is the self-esteem trap. Like, this is the low self-esteem trap. If I'm not Ensign Mary Sue, the youngest lieutenant in Starfleet ever, I have no worth, right? This this exceptionalism bullshit that in a story we'd be like, no, that's bad. That's annoying. I automatically hate you. And yet we put pressure on ourselves to be that very thing that it was a fictional character. We'd be like, why would I relate to that, right? Now, okay, we go back to old school myth and, you know, heroes and yeah, Hercules, super strong, you know, all the different, different. That's a, that's a, uh, post character driven narrative structure. Um, what I found is that if you can find a character you relate to and kind of relate to both the nobility of the character and the character's imperfections, you can use these characters to structure a healthy explanatory style. Treat yourself like you would a character in a story, right? If you were reading a story about this person, would you think they're a loser? Or would you think they're going through a bad time and the deck's really stacked against them, right? When I was a kid, there were very few female characters I related to. Um, the closest was Tila in Masters of the Universe, but not quite. I was more the character of that era that I was really like, that's me, was Lionel in Thundercats. And then it was Beast in X-Men. And as I got older it became wolverine from x-men tendency to jump into situations first one in last one knocked out get out jump back in you know we we don't we don't love wolverine because of style points he's the best at what he does and what he does ain't pretty right these were the things that helped me overcome the fact that I was not, at the time, anybody's idea of a dream girl, right? I wasn't Mary Jane Watson. I, I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't that. I was some fucked up monster dude who found his way to eke out in the world, and especially with Beast, because he was, like, super smart. He, like, hung upside down while, while reading Shakespeare, and I just thought that was the fucking shit, man. And I couldn't figure out, like, he's a dude who can hang upside down and read Shakespeare. Why the fuck do you care if he has blue fur? That's awesome. I could never understand people's rejection of Beast. But that made me go, wait, then why do I accept people's rejections of me? Like, I can see the worth in this fictional character, and he has blue fucking fur and fangs. Hey, turn that light inward, right? Um, the first female characters that I really saw anything remotely of myself in were Gem and the Holograms. I think in part because they had jobs, in part because they had hair colors not found in nature, and that's how I kind of felt at the time. Um, but I had to adapt Gem 
where okay they were musicians in the cartoon but when you got the toys and they had that cool doll stand and they could be like hovercraft space pew 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 like yoda i thought was the bomb r2d2 was awesome i was more about luke skywalker than han solo right i i really saw myself more in luke skywalker than even princess leia um those female identifiers came much later because I, I was never given praise for any feminine virtues when I was a kid. That was my sister. My sister was the cute and pretty one. I was a smart and useful one, right? I could read instruction books and teach you how to hook up your VCR when I was 10. But I wasn't cute. You know, people brand you. Now, you can decide if you're going to accept those narratives or if you're going to create your own. And over time, you know, I, uh, I started picking up female archetypes that I could relate to. Mortal Kombat was a really early one because, you know, they did things and, and Melina wasn't perfect looking. She had that friggin', you know, monstrous thing when she took off her mask. And yeah, OK, she's still, you know was Kitana's clone in every other way. But hey, it was a female character that wasn't perfect looking, right? Cool. That was a starting point. The the one the two that were really watersheds for me were Poison Ivy um and uh Power Girl. Um Poison Ivy was sort of sexy but not submissive. And the anger inherent to that character g gave me permission to not be a proper girl. Um, before that, it was Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. That was sort of my first thing. When I was 16 years old, I made a, a Halloween costume by myself. The same way uh, Selena Kyle makes um, makes a costume in the second Keaton Batman film. She just tore apart old clothes and sewed them back together. That's exactly how I made the costume. And let me tell you, for one night... I was not the girl nobody noticed. And that was, it's like, okay, this is interesting. Guys who never talked to me before didn't notice I was alive, just walked right past me, just all of a sudden, oh, I exist. Interesting. I'm the same damn person, not fat and ugly now, am I? Really? Okay. But that's where the poison ivy anger started, right? Like, you start seeing the Matrix. And so I went from that to Power Girl, which was the character that convinced me I wasn't fat. I just had really giant boobs and I had a giant butt. No, I had to be told that. Because don't forget, outside of video games, it was the Wayfarer. It was heroin chic. It was Kate Moss. That was, that was the ideal, right? Like, we weren't into thick women yet in media. So it was those extremes. It was the Mary Sue or the character with no agency, right? Um, and that's what really got me into cosplay. It was, let me take on this character. Let me perform as this character. Let me take away a piece of that experience that gives me a more positive story I tell about myself. You know, these are all flawed characters. So what makes them good? And through cosplaying these characters, I learned, I kind of trained my brain to focus on the positive elements in, instead of the things that made them and me imperfect, right? Because a good character's always got flaws. Superman has kryptonite, right? Like every character's got a weakness, you don't want somebody who, you know, is God modded. We, again, we know this about literature, but we don't turn that light on ourselves. And, you know, then I got into that very weird world where I went from being, you know, a fat, ugly nerd to a cheap bimbo slop in like suddenly just changing job, totally different person. What the fuck is going on? And that was weird. That was really weird. And, you know, it was after that 
that I got the PTSD diagnosis. And all of a sudden, it's like, you got to admit, you know, there's a rock bottom point. And I started looking around for another story. Because, you know, none of these, none of these superheroes, you know, I hadn't read Iron Man at that point. Like, you know, none of the, none of these superheroes had that. They didn't, they didn't have trauma. And then I discovered God of War. And, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't intend this, but trauma is so woven into Greek myth because there's a lot of war going on that, you know, I saw that metaphor of constantly climbing out of a damn pit that you see in those God of War games. I mean, people forget in the first God of War game, the first time we see Kratos, he's throwing himself off a cliff in an attempt to take his own life because he's overcome by guilt by his past actions. People forget that now, right? Like you're exposed to that character at first in a moment of real crisis. And and then of course, you know, it's Kratos. So that's not the way it goes. But that was my new explanatory style. That was my new story I told myself about myself. I'm not a broken person. I'm Kratos. So I got freaking Scar here and Scar here. Uh, but yeah, those are cool, man. Like, I can't be those, you know, perfected superheroes anymore that, okay, they got knocked down, but, you know, even Batman doesn't throw himself off a cliff, right? With an intent to, like, not battering his way out of that. That was a story I could relate to. And that was a story I could use to structure my own explanations about what happened to me without brutal self-recriminations. And that's how you learn to self-validate. You know, you find something about a character. And, you know, keep in mind, you want them to be imperfect. You want them to be good people but you want them to be imperfect because you can see that you like this character. You feel for this character. You want this character to succeed despite their imperfections. And you apply that to yourself, right? And I think a lot of people are in the process of doing that in gaming. And that, that's why we have these nerd freakouts. But I think it's not conscious enough which is why there's that sense of you're taking this away from me no 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 just because somebody changes a story does not mean they're taking away what the character gave you in the first place like they're not that story stays you know the original god of war does not change because now it shifted from greek to norse myth it's just a continuing continuation right but this is a really powerful way to teach yourself different explanatory styles without getting so reductive that you try to force yourself into the res this ridiculous optimism that ends up making people chase a lot of false leads. Because, you know, on the one hand, you want to set practical goals, right? On the other hand, you can't just acquiesce every time somebody says you can't do something. I, I never would have even attempted to make video games if I believed what people in the industry told me about women of a certain age in game dev. I was flat out told it's too late. You're too old. And I was in my 30s at the time. It's like, no, you're a woman. It's too late. Flat out. They were trying to help me. I, I appreciate the honesty that, you know, made me realize it wasn't going to be easy and I couldn't do it conventionally. I had to just basically make shit and come get me fuckers. Like, oh, now you're interested in what I'm doing? But, you know, Agatha. Um, 
but I didn't just accept that. I didn't accept that external opinion as the only valid one, right? And the nice thing about that is if it works out, if it doesn't work out, at least I can say I tried. And that's, you know, another key. Not, you know, that external validation thing, that explanatory style of, oh, you did something and failed. No, you did something and tried. And I mean, shit, every Spider-Man story ever is Peter Parker screwing up a bunch of times before he gets it right. There's a, there's a lot of, I mean, the whole made hero thing, right? Training, training, training. I think that's why people react so strongly to certain characters. They're getting, and that's where the, the ego defense comes in that I'm going to talk about later. But these are the building blocks. So your exercise this week is find a character that you relate to, that you can identify what their weaknesses are, but you can also see their strengths and you believe they are a good but flawed person. So no, you not the Joker. Like, yeah, okay, the Joker's cool as a villain, but no, for the purpose of this exercise, you know, uh, Poison Ivy's an anti-hero. Like, okay, you gotta be real careful. Like I said, it was the anger and I moved on from that. Uh, try to find a, 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 a hero or at least an anti-hero. What are these characters' flaws? What do you like about them? See if you can't apply the exact same process to yourself. Like, yeah, I'm not so great at these things. Here's my worth. I'm legitimately good at this. I might not be the absolute best, but I'm good at this. Because I guarantee you, you're good at something. And that's your starting point, right? That's the moment where Kratos went, nope, nope, not just going to go splat. That's what you're looking for. That's how, you know, self-talk, explanatory styles, all that stuff happens. Interested to see you, what you guys come up with. Going to wrap now. That was a long one. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Thanks for watching.